Hi everyone, this is part 1 in a video series where we will be creating an FPS game step by step with Bevy and the programming language Rust. In this video, we will be implementing the first person camera system and add some basic shooting to the game. By the end of this video, you will have a project similar to a task in Aim Labs. Targets will spawn in a grid, and if shot, will respawn in a random position. My explanations are by no means perfect in this video, so if you feel confused, just check out the source code in the description. You can also do so if you have trouble following along with the video. To follow this tutorial, you will need to have the dependencies for Bevy installed, as well as a functional cargo packaging system. I'll link the setup page for Bevy in the description for those of you that don't have a functioning Bevy project yet. Alright, let's go set up some dependencies. Aside from Bevy, we also need to add Bevy Rapier 3D to our project. This is a physics library which we will be consistently using throughout this series. You might notice that we have a dynamic linking feature enabled for Bevy. You don't actually need to enable that feature, it just decreases the compile time by compiling Bevy into a dynamic library. If you just want to follow the tutorial, it is not required. It can sometimes be a hassle to get working, so avoiding it might be the best if you're a beginner. The first thing we need to do is go into our main file. Let's include Bevy as a dependency. To start off, we're just going to be opening a simple window. So create a new app and add the default plugins. Next, create a new folder called game and add two files to it, one called mod.rs and one called game.rs. We're going to be creating a Bevy plugin for managing the various features of our game. This plugin will be called game plugin. Think of it as the core of our game. That might be a little vague, but bear with me and you'll begin to understand how this file works. Next, let's implement a window plugin. This plugin will be in charge of managing the resolution of the window and whether it is full screen or not. This plugin should give you an idea of how to implement a Bevy plugin. You can add systems, and you can even add plugins within the plugin. We're going to be adding the window plugin into the game plugin in order to abstract our code further. For now, we're just going to default to a 1920 pixel by 1080 pixel screen and make the window full screen. In a future tutorial, I will definitely add a way for this feature to be adaptive or customizable, but for now, just enter your monitor size into the code. Once this plugin is finished, we will add it to our game plugin in the game.rs file, and once we run the code, a full screen window should open. The screen is entirely black, which is what we want because the window is in full screen mode. Alright, now let's create a level plugin, which is going to be in charge of instantiating our level. We will basically be following the same design pattern for this plugin as the window plugin followed, except instead of setting window properties, this plugin will be adding objects to the scene. By the end of this video, you'll probably be pretty fluent in the basic Bevy design pattern. For the initialized level system, we need to spawn objects, and to do so we need three parameters an entity commands component, which is basically a tool that we can use to spawn, remove, or modify entities in our scene. Furthermore, we need to access the materials and meshes resource to properly queue meshes and materials into the standard Bevy render pipeline. The reason I included Bevy Rapier 3D as a module in this file is so we can add a collider component to each of our scene objects. Later on, we will be using these colliders to implement hitscan shooting. For our first plane, the collider is basically just a very flattened cuboid. And our second object in the scene is just a cuboid with the corresponding collider. It is important to note that the collider cuboid function constructs cuboids while the mesh cuboid function constructs a mesh with full size, so we need to multiply what we put into the collider function by 2 in order to get the right mesh to collider ratio. We don't want the scene to be pitch black, so let's add a light to the scene. This directional light will basically act as the sun. There is definitely an easier way to determine the direction of the light, but it's hard to visualize, so I'm going to be using a lookat function to make it easier to know what direction the light is shining in. If we run the code now, nothing will happen, so we need to add a camera to the scene so that Bevy actually renders to the window. This will be done through a player plugin. Again, for the third time, we will follow the design pattern from our prior plugins to create a player plugin. The player plugin will contain an init player system which just spawns a camera with the component inserted into it. This just marks it as our player for now and it won't have any properties. 
We can specify a field of view which our camera will render at. We can convert it to radians and then later on insert it into our camera 3D bundle constructor. And in this constructor, we just need to modify the projection matrix of our camera. Obviously what we're doing right now is very abstracted. It would be a lot harder in an actual graphics API like raw OpenGL. Okay, let's add these two plugins we've created back into our main game plugin. If you aren't familiar with how Rust's module system works, this should be a pretty stimulating exercise. And if we run the project, we should be staring at a wall. We aren't able to actually do anything in this scene yet, so let's add some camera controls to the game. We're going to deviate a bit from our plugin design pattern for now. Adding one for the camera controller would be a bit unneeded because if you think about it, the camera controller is basically part of the player plugin. So we just need to add a file in our player folder and create a system that we will be adding to our player plugin. The code for this system is very simple. Read the mouse motion event and modify the rotation of our camera accordingly. We will be storing the parameters for pitch and yaw as a vector2 variable in our camera controller component. In order to avoid the player flipping their camera over multiple times, we just need to clamp the Y rotation between two values. Finally, convert these variables to a quaternion, which we will be using to modify the actual rotation of the camera, and you have basic FPS camera controls. Now we just need to add that system to our plugin. We also need to add a camera controller component to our player entity though. In this clip, I forgot to convert our degrees based camera rotation to radians when actually setting the rotation of our camera in the transform component. This would result in unusually high sensitivity, so let's go back and fix that. Okay, so you probably noticed that something is not right. Our cursor is not locked into place so our camera is not being controlled correctly. Let's make a cursor plugin which will manage our cursor, following the same design pattern which we've been practicing throughout this whole video. It might seem like overkill to create so many different plugins for a simple project like this, but trust me, it will help with code readability and maintenance in the future. Also, it is just good practice in any sort of programming to divide out your features into different modules. So let's make a resource that stores information on whether the cursor is currently being locked or not. A resource, for those of you who don't know, is just a way to store information that can be modified and accessed throughout different systems. Let's implement a function for this resource that either locks the cursor in place if it is not being locked, or unlocks the cursor in place if it is already being locked. We will call this function invert lock. The function takes a reference to the window component that Bevy allows us to modify and we'll lock the cursor in the middle of the screen and make it invisible. It will do the inverse if we're trying to unlock the cursor. So let's create... Next, let's create a system that will just in... Next, let's create a system that will just initialize the cursor properties and lock the cursor in place. And a system that will update the cursor locking by locking the cursor or unlocking the cursor with the click of the escape key. The cursor is a property of a window, so I decided to add the cursor plugin within our window settings plugin. And if we run the code now, our camera control should be working correctly. Let's add a crosshair to the game before we implement any shooting, because we need to know where we are aiming at. 
Crosshairs are part of the UI in a game, so I'm going to be adding the crosshair in a system that will ultimately be added to a UI plugin. We aren't going to, we aren't going to create the UI plugin yet, but to actually spawn the crosshair, we need to create a node bundle, which you can think of as a canvas onto which we add different UI elements. In our case, the element is a blank image that is placed at the center of the screen. To actually place the crosshair at the center of the screen, we can access the size of the window and use these properties to set the image's position to the center of the screen. This can be done by modifying where the left side of the image is and where the top side of the image is. Now we just need to add this system to a UI plugin and add the UI plugin back into our game plugin system. And with that, we have a crosshair in the center of our screen in the form of a tiny square. Now we can focus on adding some actual gameplay to the game. To start off, let's add the ability to shoot. To do this, we can create a function called update player. All of these different parameters might seem kind of complicated, but in simple terms, we will be shooting a raycast from the center of our screen. This is a type of shooting called hitscan and is the most common type of shooting in FPS games. With hitscan, you might see a projectile going towards where you are shooting, but this projectile is actually just a visual aid. There is no real projectile. We're just shooting a line from the eyes of our camera and seeing if it intersects any colliders. In our case, we use some bevy functions to find the position and direction of the ray in world space, cast a ray using the bevy rapier library's rapier context to see if it hits anything, and if it does, we will shoot a bullet tracer outwards. At this point, we've probably created so many plugins that you can probably guess how to create a bullet tracer plugin yourself. You might notice the commentary thinning out towards the end of this video. That's because I'm pretty much finished explaining all the fundamentals. Within this tracer plugin, we will create a system in charge of moving the bullet tracers spawn after raycasting. This will work by noting the start and end points of a tracer and interpolating between these two points based on a time that is determined through how far the two points are from each other. To determine the lifetime of a tracer, I decided to create a very reusable function for doing so within the bullet tracer struct itself. This function takes the form of a constructor which makes it even more reusable. It takes the start point, the end point, and the speed as parameters. And with this, we can determine how long the bullet should be alive based on the distance between the points and the speed the bullet should supposedly be traveling at. The vector3 lerp function basically finds the position on a line between two points with 0 representing the very beginning and 1 representing the very end. So if we calculate a ratio using the time the bullet has been alive since being spawned and the total lifetime it should have, we have a very robust interpolation system. Now is probably a good idea to explain how queries work. All of the queries which we've been using up to this point have been to query for a single entity. I probably should have explained this at the start, but a query basically finds all entities that have the listed components. It gets these components for us to modify, and if we call iter mute or iter, it will traverse through these entities either immutably or mutably and let us modify them in a system. The reason I've put off explaining them till now is again because we've been only dealing with single entity queries, which should be pretty intuitive as grabbing the only entity in the scene with the required components using get single mute or get single, which either gets the components mutably or immutably. Now we just need to add the bullet tracer into our scene once we get a raycast hit. To do so, we again need to access the resources for meshes and materials and use our entity commands to spawn the bullet tracer so that it seems a little less like a block and more like a gunshot. I think the rest of this code is pretty self-explanatory. 
We don't want to see the bullet when we first spawn it, so we'll spawn it at infinity. The update bullet tracer system will sync it anyway so it doesn't really matter where we spawn it as long as we don't get to see it. We can call our bullet tracer constructor which we created previously in order to set the correct properties for our tracer. And afterwards, we just need to configure our plugins the right way and our code should be running the right way. Now that we're able to shoot, we should probably add some targets to shoot at. And as stated at the start of this video, I want to create a sort of aim routine like the ones in aim labs. And those require randomness, so let's add a crate called rand, something that is very difficult to do in native rust. Now I probably should have done this at the start of the video, but I didn't want to overcomplicate things. Now back to what I was saying about the routine being somewhat like aim labs. Now that's not to say that this series is about creating aim labs. We're actually looking to make a fully functional FPS game, but I've found that this is the best way to test out our shooting system to see if it actually works. Okay, with that misconception out of the way, let's get back to explaining the code. Each target will have a target component and a dead target component. The dead target component is only added to the target when it's been shot, and later on you'll see how we utilize the dead target component to reset the position of a target. But first we need a function that will actually generate a new position. Because our resource already contains all the information we need to generate a random position, I decided to implement this function inside of our resource. The grid shot resource has three variables. Grid size represents how large the grid is. Cell size is how large the individual cells in the grid are. And max targets is how many targets can be active at one time. Basically, the targets don't actually disappear. When we shoot one, it just gets reset, and this is the amount of targets that can be alive at once. Using these properties, we can generate a random position. Just a note to understand the code, the rand.generange function has an inclusive lower bound and an exclusive upper bound unless specified otherwise. The generate new position function might take a while to understand, but in the end, if you understand the rand.generange function, it's just simple arithmetic. Within our initialization system, we first initialize a material and the grid shot resource. Next, I decided the collider size should be smaller than the actual display size of the target, which will eventually be a sphere. This is because our collider is a cuboid, but our mesh is a sphere. So if we set the cuboid to the same size as a sphere, then shooting the corner of the cuboid, which is not actually part of the sphere, would still allow the target to die, which is not something we want. It's also more challenging, which is another reason I decided to do it. Alright, now let's implement a system that will reset the positions of dead targets. There are several things to be mindful of when creating this system. The first thing is that the targets cannot reset to the same position that they were already at. This would look incredibly dumb and it might give the player misinformation that we missed the target. And second, the target needs to reset to a spot where there is no other target. So we basically need to keep relocating the target using our generate random function until these two checks are satisfied. We will query through all of the dead targets and alive targets and keep track of which targets are alive. After we remove the dead target component from a dead target and reset the position, that target needs to be added into the alive targets list. And this is basically how we reset all of the dead targets to newly generated positions. Doing it this way allows for multiple targets to be dead in the same frame and still be reset. And with that, our tutorial is complete. I might have glazed over some details in my explanations, but if you follow the tutorial visually, all of the code was done on screen. Additionally, the source code is linked in the description, so if you have any trouble, you can check that out. I hope this video was helpful.